um, short course of three, uh, protecting our heritage, war and cultural heritage. And previously we looked at what we do before war, and then we looked at uh, during war. And now we're going to look at after war and see what exactly can we do to protect heritage after war and how should we um, approach this? So we've got to really start to think, what does recovery mean in the long term? What does it actually mean when we say we're on the road to uh, recovery? Um, I just have to move this out of the way. OK, so when we think about uh, a situation like a war, which is like a disaster situation, we, there are various phases. The first phase really is the rescue phase, when really the only goal is to find um, human survivors. And then after that, we move into what we call um, the early recovery phase. And the early recovery phase is when there's no real expectation of finding survivors. And the priority is to secure buildings and provide basic needs for the population. Well, it's quite important, it's very important, in fact, that we approach cultural heritage during that early recovery phase, that it is part of the um part of the the uh the early recovery um, uh, rescue that goes on. And the reason for that is because heritage actually can't be left to wait. It used to be thought, oh, well, we'll leave it and then we'll get everything else sorted out and then we'll go back and sort out the cultural heritage. But we now know that that is too late, in fact, to do that, that if you leave it that long, you don't have um, the ability to do that because it has been destroyed. Um, you need to go in and ensure that there's some protection and then ensure that it's in a state where you can leave it so that later on you can come back and you can um, you can make a decision about what you want to do with all of the um, heritage buildings of this culture. But it is very important that that happens because it is very fundamental to, um, to the people there. Um, and um, I'm giving a plug, as I do seem to every week, uh, for ECROM and in particular for their project uh, Culture Cannot Wait, and that is they chose that very deliberately because it used to be a kind of mantra that, well, this can wait and you can do it later. And uh, what they're saying, well, no, it can't wait, actually, because if you leave it, it won't be there for you to do anything with. And you should see it as a resource through which humanitarian and aid and reconstruction can take place because it is not instead of doing humanitarian aid, it is about doing it through the culture, through the people. Um, and this particular ECROM project proposes to um, train a mixed group of disaster risk management uh, professionals, emergency responders, military personnel, humanitarian aid, and cultural heritage uh, professionals with the idea of having a coordinated activity, which gets uh, the resources to the people who need them as quickly as possible. So we're not in any way saying that this is instead of aid or that it uh, should in any way impede it. We're actually saying that if it is done through the local culture, it actually gets to people quicker and more effectively. Because cultural heritage really is the bedrock of cultural resilience. And cultural resilience is hugely important. That is allowing people to, to decide themselves what they want to do and giving them the support so that they can respond themselves because that is always a much better outcome. And they need their own structures, 
their own ways of life. They need that in order to do it. If you like create a kind of um, uh, an emergency situation, a situation where maybe, you know, everything seems foreign to uh, the people you're trying to help. They don't have anything familiar. They don't have any hooks on which um, they can understand what is going on. Well, you are going to make it that much more difficult for them to respond themselves. And the way that they can get to that um, stage of taking control themselves is through having their own culture and their own familiar uh, things around them. So there is a great emphasis on restoring a thread of continuity, that is habits of everyday life, allowing people to get back the habits of their ordinary life so they can as soon as possible um, get back to some semblance of normality, which is extremely important for everybody's mental health, for their morale and for their ability uh, to work through this great tragedy that has um, hit them. And most, most important in particular is restoring religious life. This is particularly crucial. Um, and there have been many instances in um, conflict and disasters where um, rescue teams have gone in and the local population have asked them first to restore the religious buildings, because having uh, that being supported by your faith is one of the best ways of um, dealing with such a tragedy. People need their faith more than any, more than anything in that situation. Um, but it's very, very important to involve local communities in decision-making. Um, in the January course, we mentioned this um, and uh, Rohit Jigyasu, who was with us then uh, from ECROM and who specializes in disasters, um, emphasize this hugely as well, that there may well be very different priorities for a local population um, as opposed to a national government or an international aid organization. Uh, local people have uh, their own particular priorities, and they may not correspond to something like a national monument or the World Heritage List, they may be totally uninterested in what's on a World Heritage List. It may be something uh, very close to them, which for them is the key thing in their lives. And these priorities have to be set with the local population in mind. Um, because long-term post-conflict reconstruction is not actually about reconstructing buildings. It's about reconstructing society. It's uh, reconstructing the building, you know, really in the great scheme of things is relatively easy. Even if it looks as sort of a bit um, daunting at the beginning, we know how to reconstruct buildings. But reconstructing societies is, you know, is something that's much more difficult. And we have to remember as well that heritage buildings, they are the site of the intangible cultural heritage of the community. So when um, often when heritage professionals look at them, they perhaps think a little bit too much maybe about um, the position of the monument in its terms of its um, historical importance or its artistic importance, because often to local people, that's not the most important thing. And we have to be looking at it through their eyes to see what is the most important thing to them, what is gonna help them the most at this particularly awful moment in their lives. Um, now, I've got this um, picture up, which I've mentioned before in some previous presentations, and we're going to come on to talk a little bit about Warsaw after World uh, War II, which we have mentioned before. Um, but it is an absolutely fascinating example of people, you know, very much taking the um, initiative, making sure that, that their um, wishes were important. And, and I think we can learn from that experience. So 
In the Second World War, the city of Warsaw was um, completely obliterated. Um, first of all, in 1939, there was an air raid which destroyed um, 782 out of 987 historical buildings in the old town. And then in 1944, uh, there was an uprising and Hitler ordered the city to be razed to the ground, to be totally um, annihilated. And at first, the annihilation was so complete, it was suggested that the ruins should just be left as ruins. But the people did not want that. They wanted their city back. And so a massive rebuilding and reconstruction took place. And this was to rebuild the city as it had been before, to rebuild the city to look like it had looked like before. Um, now, this is a quite extraordinary thing to do. I mean, even rebuilding one monument is, you know, pretty amazing, but to actually reconstruct the city. And here we have um, Market Square in um, Warsaw. Um, so all of this, you know, uh, looks late medieval, uh, but in actual fact, um, it's 1950s. It's all being um, reconstructed. Um, so in many ways, it's not authentic. And that uh, is something that was kind of noted at the time. Um, in many respects, it was really going against the accepted orthodoxy um, of conservation because we don't do reconstruction like this. And certainly in the middle of the 20th century, um, that was very much the orthodoxy. And when the um, Venice Charter was brought into force in 1966, it absolutely said you should not reconstruct except for anastylosis. Anastylosis being like when you've got the constituent blocks of something that's just fallen over, you can put them back together again. But and that is a very sort of, um, um, in a sense, it's a very academic approach. You know, we are not going to create anything that is not authentic. But it is not really taking into consideration um, the needs of people. Um, undoubtedly, the reconstruction of Warsaw was an act of defiance. You know, the citizens of Warsaw had been um, attacked by two forces that wanted their city totally annihilated. And they were saying, well, you know, you aren't going to do it. You are not going to do that to us. We are going to react. And it was essential, really, that it was rebuilt, even though it was not the sort of standard orthodoxy. Um, when Warsaw came to go for world heritage status, this became a real bit of an issue um, because it didn't conform to how it was imagined that conservation should be done. But it was allowed through because, I mean, to, to not allow it was really unthinkable. Um, and since then, we've started to sort of understand a little bit more, I think, that sometimes reconstruction is absolutely what is needed for the people. And regardless of whether it's what a kind of professional would do or would think is right, we have to acknowledge the needs of local people who've been through very tragic circumstances. Um, and it was really very much a part of post-conflict healing. When we talk about post-conflict, um, we need to get away a little bit from just thinking this is all just about doing the buildings. It's not, it's about reconstructing the society and the buildings are an essential part of that reconstruction, but we need to see them not just in architectural terms, but uh, their social importance as well and uh, what, they, what they mean to that society. 
Um, because reconstructing familiar places can be key to healing. And we've got a much more recent example than um, Warsaw. We have an example from Mosul. Um, so this is uh, a photograph taken in 1932, which is um, showing on the right uh, the Nuri Mosque and the Al Hadba Minaret. And I think you can see even at this angle that um, it's actually very crooked. And that was what it was famous for. It was famous uh, because it started to lean. It was built in the 12th century. And um, within a couple of centuries, it had a very notable lean to it. Um, and in fact, was locally known as the Hunchback. There you go was locally known as the Hunchback because um, it had this very particular uh, shape and it became in many ways the symbol of Mosul. And in 2017, uh, ISIS militants um, blew it up. And I think we can see here more clearly the lean that uh, there is. Um, I mean, similar in certain ways to the Leaning Tower of Pisa, how that started to lean too. But this was, you know, this was what everybody grew up with and knew and saw. And um, the local people, when they realized that ISIS were going to blow it up, they tried to stop it and they, they stopped a complete destruction of it. But of course, you know, it was very, very severely damaged. And uh, you can see there um, a quote from one of the inhabitants of Mosul of what it was like to lose this much loved uh, monument. So now it's being rebuilt, but the local people want it to be exactly as they remember it. So they want it to be rebuilt with the lean in it as well, which of course is technically quite difficult to do. Um, to actually build it to be like that is not very easy. And, um, you know, you might think, well, why would you do that? Because that leaning was a fault. It wasn't supposed to be there. It was a fault. But the point is that in order to, you know, to help the healing process of the local population, they have to have this monument back as they remember it not as we want it to be, but, you know, or as we feel that technically it should be or artistically it should be or historically it should be. They don't actually really care about that. They want their very familiar building back as they remember it and as they know it. So you've got to, at certain points, you've got to seed that the... Uh, needs of the local population absolutely trump any kind of uh, sort of historical or artistic um, considerations that you might want to, to give it. And that's really um, both Warsaw and um, also um, the Mosul Minaret are really what we might say successful reconstructions um, in that they're fulfilling their job. But reconstructions are not always quite so successful. And again, we've mentioned Mostar before. Um, not everybody uh, here tonight did the January course. Um, some of you did and some of you didn't. So I hope that those of you who did won't mind me recapping a little bit this situation because Mostar is really a... Um, it really is a kind of textbook example of how for all the best reasons, something might turn out wrong, if you see what I mean, that people went in thinking this was going to be the solution, this was going to help everyone. But in actual fact, it turned out to be, in many respects, not so, not, not so successful. Um, so just to recap, in November 1993, the Mostar Bridge was blown up um, in the Balkan Wars, and it, was, it became a symbol of the ethnic divisions that had caused the war. 
it was seen as being a very significant uh, loss of a monument because first of all, um, it was um, a 16th century uh, bridge built by uh, a famous Muslim architect, but it also um, was uniting different sides of the town where different ethnic groups uh, lived. Mostar before the war um, was a multi-ethnic town which had um, certain areas that were predominantly one ethnicity, but by and large, they had minority populations in all of them and they lived together without any um, real uh, problems. Uh, there were a lot of um, marriages between different ethnic groups. Um, and in many ways, this bridge was seen as a kind of symbol of that. And that's why it was blown up. Um, and this was something that was very programmed as a kind of media event. All of the media television were there in order to record it. So it was seen as being extremely important to uh, rebuild it after the war. And first of all, there was a temporary cable bridge and then a big international project moved in to rebuild this bridge. And to be honest, there was no shortage of money. There was money from um, UNESCO, uh, the World Bank, the Aga Khan Foundation, the World Monuments Fund, the Council of Europe, and the governments of Italy, Turkey, Croatia, and the Netherlands. Uh, the one thing they weren't short of in this project is money. And uh, they got a beautiful reconstruction. It costs a lot of money in um, in those days, 15.5 million was, you know, quite a lot of money. But the problem is that very little of this money reached the local people. Uh, almost all the money was spent on foreign NGOs and foreign experts, and there was really very little engagement with uh, local people. The end result was a bridge that looks really beautiful, but a town that was dysfunctional. And a society that is divided. And um, whereas previously it was uh, a unified town, now there are two school systems, two hospitals, two water companies, two bus companies, uh, two schools, uh, everything is divided. Um, and you're either in one side or the other side. And a lot of people think that this is really, you know, something that is uh, a tragedy waiting to happen. That when you have people living side by side like this, but not actually interacting with each other, you are laying the foundations for future conflicts. And you have to ask the question, if international aid agencies had not come in and completely taken over the rebuilding of the Mostar Bridge, as being some sort of, um, you know, jewel in their crown, as something that they could say they had done, if instead they had worked through a solution uh, to rebuilding it using everybody in the town so that everybody was engaged in the rebuilding of this bridge, um, you know, we would have had, well, we would have had a much longer project, that's absolutely for sure, is it takes a lot longer to do things that way. But we might have had um, a bridge uh, built that ultimately brought people together instead of a situation where this is a totally divided society. Because in peace building, how you do something is as important as what you do. So how you go about doing it is really key. It is not uh, the case that, you know, everybody, you have to get this thing done as quickly as possible and, you know, um, finish it and then present it to the people and say, well, there you go. You know, we've given you your bridge. Um, you know, there's more to it than that. And you have to work through um issues in the society to bring people together, to bring very traumatized people to, together, you know, and it's not going to be easy. So before I go on to regime change, I think I'll just go to, um, 
sorry, let me stop share for a second. I'll um, just go to uh, Melissa and Sarah and see if there are any uh, questions or anything you'd like to bring up. That's... Yeah, we have a really great uh, question from Pauline. Um, uh -huh. Their question is um, really talking about how often in um, you know development and human rights and peace building, there is not a thought about cultural heritage. Um, so their question is, how can we advocate for heritage to become part of a peace builder and aid workers lexicon? And how can we call for our actions to be truly heritage sensitive? Well, I think that's exactly what ECROM are trying to do in setting up this project to bring everyone together. I think it all comes down to training, ultimately. And you can't sort of train when a crisis is going on. I mean, that's not the right time for it. You need to be doing it ahead of time and showing how you can help the process Um Interestingly, one of my colleagues at American University in Rome um, is uh, she teaches on our peace studies program and she teaches humanitarian aid and she works for NATO. And um, she told me that that is absolutely their uh, approach these days, that they believe absolutely you must work through local culture. Um, and she's got numerous examples of how aid has just failed to get to the right people because they were trying to work through kind of Western ideas of how you distribute aid. Whereas, in fact, if they tried to do it through the local culture, they would have had a much better result. And so, so I think it's I think it's in short in a short word, it's about training and about information, you know, about getting the word out to, to people. So, um, is there, uh, Melissa, did you notice anything in particular? So I think Melissa's audio is not working today. Oh, is it not? Oh, okay. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> um, so I, uh, there's actually um, a question from Emily asking about in post-war contexts where um, war has been an internal or of an internal or civil nature. Um, mm -hmm. How can heritage professionals ensure that heritage is safeguarded in all of its interpretations when there is multitudes of, of interpretations um, that are often the source of the conflict itself? Well, that's a really good point, actually, um, which um, I thought about putting into this presentation and then in the end didn't because it was too big, a, too big an issue. But of course, one of the things that you've got to tackle uh, in doing this is that there will be these different interpretations. And if you've got a multi-ethnic situation, they almost certainly were one of the causes of the conflict in the first place. So if you try to ignore them, and if you try to not deal with them, um, in your post-conflict reconstruction, well, you know, you're likely to get the result back down the line again that you had before. Um, and um, once again, I think it comes down to kind of training and, um, and being prepared to deal with this. And often heritage professionals have not had that kind of training. I mean, um, You'll remember, Sarah, also Melissa, we kind of encourage you to do these courses in um, negotiation and conflict management that we offered because uh, you really do need to have some skills in that uh, often. Um, but I think we I think the soft skills that are needed is something we can definitely work on. Um, and it's not going to be very easy for sure. But um, if we try to do the reconstruction, if we try to, without addressing the underlying issues, then, um, you know, I don't think we'll have done a very good job. Uh, but I do think that one of, the, one of the main issues with this type of thing is that you're working with aid agencies, and if you're working with governments, you're working essentially with 
often politicians or people who are working to an agenda of the government. And all of them really have short term mindset. You know, they have um, they have to produce results within a certain amount of time. And that's kind of the way we organize our society. And one of the problems with this is it's often time consuming. And, you know, you might not be able to fit into that time frame, I would say. OK, I'll go back and I'll come we'll come back um, and have some more great questions, though. Um, so um, what about what happens when we have regime change? This is another aspect of um, post-conflict. What do you do with... Uh, the monument statues, etc., of a now discredited regime. Well, there's no real, um, you know, I would say there's no real, um, you know, answer to this in that there's not one answer. Um, it's kind of people deal with it in different ways. And um, I think it's really, you know, up to the country itself, up to the area itself to decide what is the best way of dealing uh, with it. It will depend a lot on the context. But I thought I would just show you uh, three different examples, very, very different. Um, not to say that any of them are wrong. They're just very different. Um, they were the decisions made, you know, kind of by that society. That was what they thought was the right thing. So um, the real issue is, are you going to keep the monuments or are you going to destroy them? Um, are you going to keep them in order to, you know, say, well, this is a part of our history and uh, we need to be reminded of it? Or are you going to say, well, these could be uh, the focus of uh, discontent, or they could be focus for a future rebellion, we're going to get rid of them. Um, so Germany, for example, chose to destroy or deliberately leave to decay monuments and buildings whose association with the Nazis was too strong. They went through immediately after the Second World War, they went through a strong denazification of all um, symbols. And uh, the reason uh, they were, it was pretty overt, the reason for doing it, it was to, uh, to not allow them to become the focus of uh, new activity by neo-Nazis. Um, so for example, this is uh, the square underneath this uh, square where these apartment blocks are. This is where Hitler's bunker uh, was, but it was um, covered over, bulldozed over, and nothing there that uh, could be used in any way as a focal point for any uh, people who were still sympathetic to, to Hitler. Um, and then this is um, a film that was taken at the time um, of the denazification. I'm going to skip through a bit because it's actually not much happens for the first bit. Now that's Nuremberg where the rallies were held and they actually did try to blow up some of the uh, big building as well that there is uh, there, which was the kind of podium where um, Hitler used to stand and give speeches. But it transpired that it was so well built, it was actually quite resistant to being blown up. And in the end, uh, they uh, pretty much left it for a long time, those uh, fields were really just, um, they were just abandoned um, throughout most of the 20th century. But just recently, rather interestingly, just recently, they decided to 
uh, make the area into a park and put a documentation center there. But um, that, you know, was something like um, 60, 70 years after the end of the war that they decided to do that. Now, Italy had a completely different approach and retains to this day many symbols of fascism, uh, which often quite shock foreigners, but um, don't really shock Italians a great deal. I mean, some people don't like it, but it doesn't um, appear to have, they don't appear to have been in any way a rallying point um, in the same way that Germany feared, for example, Nazi symbols um, would be. Um, so uh, I'm just gonna show you one place, probably the, the most extreme example. Uh, this is the Foro Italico, and anyone who follows football probably uh, knows it because uh, the big stadium that you're seeing is the Olympic Stadium. Um, it was actually built as part of the original um, uh, stadia in the 1930s, but it's been added on to, which is why it looks modern, but it was originally 1930s. Um, and this is where currently uh, the Italian national team play when they play national matches. Uh, this is where uh, two Serie A teams play, uh, Roma and Lazio play. So it gets a lot of use. Um, and then we can't see it here, but going off um, down to the uh, bottom left-hand corner, there are the um, lots of swimming pools for national swimming competitions and tennis courts as well. So it's a big national sporting center. And uh, this H-shaped building that you see here, well, that actually is the Italian um, Olympic Committee. So, um, so it's a big national symbol. So um, some people are a little shocked that when they go to this big national symbol, one of the things that greets you is this extremely tall obelisk to Mussolini, which is um, still there. And then when you get past the obelisk to Mussolini, you find lots of mosaics. Uh, Duce was the name for Mussolini. Um, and then this is a mosaic that says Italy finally has its empire. So it's like um, blowing the imperial ambitions of, um, of fascism. And then um, I took these, so they're not terribly good photos. <laughs> but there were also these big plaques that um, uh, glorify the achievements of uh, fascism, which is the declaration of an empire, uh, conquering um, Ethiopia, etc. Um, and this is where the national team play. And then next to it is the what's called the Stadio dei Marmi because of these marble statues. Uh, right. And this was used for um, fascist rallies, in fact. Uh. Outside the stadium stands this gigantic monolith of Carrara marble, a monument to Mussolini himself. The lower portion alone weighs over 300 tons. And inside the forum, marble again predominates. Surrounding the track are some 60 statues representing athletics and presented by each Italian province. Whilst this particular sports ground will only hold 20,000 spectators, an adjoining stadium will have accommodation for over 100,000 certainly the finest of its kind in the world. Every form of athletic exercise and game is provided for. Mussolini is building a new Rome, but he means to see that the Romans shall have help with which to enjoy it. Um, and then inside the Olympic, uh, part of the Olympic building are also um, wall paintings, frescoes that are, you know, 
also have a very political agenda. But as I say, this is not really caused, um, it really is something that I think a lot of foreigners find hard to understand, but it doesn't cause huge issues in Italy. Um, another approach is to satirize uh, your former fallen leaders. So uh, this one, for example, is um, uh, there is um, a park in Lithuania which has collected together all of the um, statues of communists after the fall of communism. And uh, you can go and sort of have your photograph taken there. So different approaches that deal with it in a different way. Um, and um, I'm not saying that any of them are wrong. Uh, they're sort of the individual choices of those societies. But another thing you'll have to, in a post-conflict situation, deal with is how do you remember people who died and how do you remember the atrocities? Because that is also something that further down the line needs to be addressed. Um, obviously, what comes to mind the most in... Um, uh, when we think of the Second World War, is the Holocaust. But it's worthwhile mentioning that this has, the reaction to that has changed a lot over time. So, for example, Auschwitz did get visitors right from 1945 onwards. In fact, very surprisingly, in 1946, it had 100,000 visitors. Um, and then it carried on having a lot of visitors, but I mean, now it gets even more. Um, but since then, the desire to record this has grown and grown. Um, and Holocaust museums are now um, more popular than they've ever been. So this is not dying out in any way. In fact, if anything, it's becoming stronger. There's now nearly 200 uh, throughout the world. Um, and um, in Jerusalem itself, Yad Vashim, which was established in 19, first established in 1953, in 2005 opened the current complex, which is four times the size of the previous site. So um, it shows that interest in the Holocaust and a desire to remember it doesn't is getting stronger and stronger. So you can't assume that the interest in the war and uh, the conflict is going to get is going to diminish with time because often it does not. Often, in fact, it gets more complex as time goes on. Um, and I wanted just to finish. Um, uh, I appreciate this is a very sort of um, speedy run through all the issues of post-conflict, but they are complex. But uh, a very interesting um, organization is the International Coalition of Sites of Conscience, which um, links together sites across the globe that have been places where atrocities have happened and um, links them together in order to ensure that memories are not forgotten, that memories are given a place, because we've come to understand just how important that is, um, how we really have to work at peace. It is not something we shouldn't see conflict as being, as peace as being the norm and conflict as being something, you know, that um, happens every so often and then we get back to our, you know, normality of peace. Um, conflict is really pretty much, um, you know, there all the time and it's up to us to manage it and to uh, deal with it um, in the most positive way. And to do that, we have to keep working at it and we have to keep uh, in particular, we have to memorialize it in a way in order to learn and ensure that future generations learn as well. So this is a very interesting um, uh, site that I urge you to have a look at because it's got some, some really um, amazing stories there. So I think that's, yeah, I'm just going to come out of screen share. 
And um, before we go to Heather and Eamon, I'll just go back to Sarah and um, see if there's anything you'd like to bring up from me. So we had um, Nur, uh, they brought up um, that in Benghazi, uh, there is a huge demolition campaign in the uh, historic city center oh. without any differentiation um, you know, of historic sites and without sharing any, any future plans. Um, and so then uh, Nur asks in the Q&A, how can we prevent new authorities and post-conflict countries from speculating over heritage buildings and their sites? Is mm -hmm. there a mechanism to stop local authorities from demolishing a few his, a full historic center like what is happening in Benghazi right now? Well, that's really tragic. No, I don't think there is, to be honest. Uh, I mean, you know, if a government wants to do that, there's not really much that, well, certainly international organizations can't stop them from doing it. So, um, no, that's really sad. I'm really sad to hear that. I see there's some questions about dark tourism. Um, yeah, dark heritage, as it's called, which is heritage connected to sort of negative periods of history. It is one of the fastest growing uh, fields. And in actual fact, there's a big movement as well to use tourism in peace building, uh, you know, to sort of make tourism into part of the learning process. And um, so it's um, it's actually quite, you know, quite big. I see uh, Guillermo is talking about the civil war in Spain. And that's, Spain is a great example as well. Um, in Spain, they actually passed a law to kind of tell people they had to forget about Franco and what had happened at that time. But people cannot forget. I mean, you know, you just can't sort of, that's not something you can pass a law to do. And um, it comes back and now it's becoming a very big issue when for a long time it wasn't. So you can't assume that, um, you know, everybody will lose interest in what happened in a conflict, you know, with time, because that doesn't really happen. But before we go to Heather and Eamon, would you, is there anything else, Sarah, you'd like to? Yeah, actually, just going off of um, what you said about Spain, there's actually a really good documentary called The Silence of Others. Yeah. It was, um, yeah. But it covered this issue with the law of forgetting and just really how devastating it is that there's been no, you know, mechanism really for justice and, you know, recourse for victims of what happened um, in the conflict there. So recommend it for everybody interested in this. It really is devastating to people to... Um, not be allowed to sort of remember. It's so important. It's such an important uh, part. And that was what happened initially to the Holocaust uh, survivors, to the survivors of concentration camps. Uh, they got back home and nobody wanted to hear their stories. You know, everybody said, oh, we've all suffered in the war, you know. And it was not until over a decade later that these stories really began to be told. And, and I think we, we need to remember the really terrible, um, you know, toll that that takes on people when you don't allow them to, to tell their stories. But, okay, at this point, I think I'll bring in Heather and Eamon, if you're there. Hi, Eamon. Hi, Heather. Um, oops, Heather, I think your audio is not on. There you go. Is that it? No, still can't hear you. And I could hear you before, so I'm not quite sure why that is. So have a have a have a have a look around and I'll just explain <laughs> who you are. Right? So um Heather is one of our alums and she has been working um with ECROM in the um Restoring Mosul project. Uh, she initially uh, did this as part of her degree, but now she has graduated and now she's a consultant um, with them, uh, whilst also 
uh, doing her own work um, in um, as an architect in um, conservancy work in Los Angeles. She's also a consultant for um, uh, the Mosul project. And Eamon also has been working on the, um, the Mosul project. So this is um, a slightly different project to many others in that it's really focusing on the people because it's focusing on the fact that one of the things that happens in post-conflict situations is you also have lost your professional classes. You know, you've lost your skilled workers. Um, that's one of the problems is people have been in war a long time. Um, people have been killed, but as well as that, um, there just hasn't been the normal educational process that trained people. So a real um, need um, immediately is to start to train people. And that's very much what the Restoring Mosul project is. So um, are you with can us? Can you hear me now, Valerie? <laughs> yes, I can hear you now. <laughs> okay, that's right. Oh, thank goodness you're back with us. I'm so, back. You're back, you're back. So um, Heather, let me start off first uh, with you. Can you just explain a little bit what the Restoring Mosul project is to everyone? Sure, um, I came into the project um, after uh, there had, it was an eight month course and Iman can actually give you more information because he is intricately involved in this can, even today. Um, but I came into this after the completion of the first round of um, students went through the eight month course and it was divided up into eight different modules uh, really focused on mm -hmm. <clears throat> identifying heritage and then how do you address heritage after conflict? What are the steps that need to be taken to um, appropriately assess how to move forward with communities, heritage and the rebuilding process? And so the first class was just presenting their final presentations of what they were proposing for one building that was selected as a case study, which was a prayer house um, in old Mosul. And um, I got to listen to those presentations. And then my involvement was really trying to uh, make this an online program to go from an in-person program to an online program to really reach more people. And, um, but Iman can give you much more information. He was on the <laughs> ground in the yeah. classes. So uh, he, he's a coordinator for the project. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's go to uh, Iman. Can you tell us a bit more about the project? Yeah, sure. Thank, thank, thank you, uh, Heather and Valerie for the invitation. Uh, I can't talk for hours about the, <laughs> the project, sorry. But I'll try to give you uh, a brief uh, idea about uh, what we do, what ICROM do in, in Mosul. Uh, ICROM Heritage Recovery Program in Mosul is a capacity, uh, two years capacity building uh, project uh, in Mosul. It has, it consists uh, two tracks, uh, track one, which is uh, uh, for uh, uh, building uh, professionals, I mean, uh, ar young architects and uh, uh, engineers uh, from Mosul, uh, we train them uh, to, uh, uh, as, as her, uh, Heather mentioned, uh, with uh, almost like uh, six to eight months uh, on, on different uh, modules uh, to cover all aspects of uh, uh, heritage uh, recovery in post-conflict, starting from uh, situation context analysis, value assessment, damage and risk assessment, uh, documentation, uh, recovery planning, uh, and implementation. And uh, track two, uh, we also, uh, as, as uh, you mentioned, we uh, also train uh, building cra uh, crafts uh, people in, in Mosul uh, to also uh, to complete uh, track one, actually, because uh, because of the conflict, and I may uh, talk about this uh, later, because of the conflict, uh, Mosul uh, actually lost uh, many uh, uh, crafts, especially uh, built uh, crafts like uh, alabaster, uh, traditional blacksmithing and uh, other crafts. So uh, in, in this track, we uh, are trying to uh, build, cap uh, build capacity uh, again for uh, crafts people uh, in Mosul. And uh, we, uh, we finished track one, which is we trained over 70 uh, crafts uh, people from uh, Mosul on, on the traditional uh, building crafts. 
And now we are almost in the mid of cycle two of uh, track one, where we uh, have another uh, uh, 25 uh, architects and civil engineers uh, from Mosul. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is an over idea about uh, uh, about the project. And uh, I don't know if you need uh, more, more information, definitely we can uh, right. tell you. And so the objective is to uh, regain the sort of base of craftsmen and building experts in mm -hmm. Mosul. Uh, do you know how big a problem this is? I mean, how many will you have to, to train in order to make it sort of sustainable for the future? Uh, well, uh, actually, to make it sustainable uh, for the future, uh, this is a very important question uh, because uh, actually we can divide this into uh, two parts. Uh, first, for the engineers and architects, it's it's very essential not only for Mosul but also for for Iraq because actually they they lack uh, the I mean uh, these experiences and. Uh, I mean, in, in heritage recovery in general, just uh, what, what we uh, train them and what uh, the international trainers that we bring to this project, trying to train the, the young architects and engineers, which is very important. Uh, and uh, the sustainability part of, of this uh, project is actually uh, to uh, integrate these uh, young architects and engineers who gain this uh, 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 expertise uh, into uh, different uh, Iraqi, uh, maybe governmental authorities. And also now UNESCO uh, is trying to uh, hire uh, our uh, graduates uh, from cycle one. Um, so this is uh, actually a challenge also to uh, integrate, uh, integrate uh, the graduates uh, of, of, uh, from, uh, from uh, track one, which is on uh, building capacities for uh, uh, exp like uh, uh, engineers and architects. And the second uh, uh, part, which is for uh, craftspeople, which is, I think, is very essential because uh, this was uh, even before the conflict, uh, the lose, uh, the loss uh, uh, of, uh, I mean, crafts uh, expertise. Uh, was before the 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 the, the conflict, uh, and now actually uh, because of uh, uh, the the, uh, the 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 actually the some of the some of the these uh, crafts were uh, uh, done by uh, specific religious or ethnic groups, and uh, some of these uh, uh, religious and uh, ethnic groups already left Mosul before or uh, this like uh, with the inter uh, internally I mean uh, within Iraq or to another uh, outside of Iraq and uh, that's how the disconnection between uh, disconnection happened between generation because they actually uh, learned their uh, I mean uh, it's it's within the family so that uh, goes uh, generation after generation and this is actually uh, the, the disconnection the conflict happened actually in, in uh, Mosul and this is make it even uh more uh difficult uh so i think for uh the crafts people uh what is uh, Im Im important is also again to uh try to find uh, uh sustainable jobs for them because uh for not only for what uh, the the crafts people that we trained them but uh we trained uh, trained them but also uh, unesco and uh other organization uh, train, uh, trying to train uh, crafts uh, people uh, in, in Mosul, they work on uh, specific uh, projects. And then when the project's uh, done, they have uh, to find another job and they, they somehow uh, disconnect uh, with the uh, knowledge and expertise uh, and uh, skills that they learned. So I yeah. think uh, this is a big issue in, in, uh, in, in Iraq to not only to train uh, uh, heritage professionals or uh, craftspeople, but also to sustain uh, mm. these uh, skills. Right, right, right. So, um, Heather, you've worked previously uh, mostly in America. Uh, what was the big difference with working in Mosul? Well, I think that what I got out of this program, which I've actually used in my, my career now, so I, I work for a firm in Los Angeles called Page and Turnbull. 
Uh, we're specifically historic architects, so we work only on historic properties. And one of the things that I got from this course was the understanding or the difficulty in understanding what significance and values um, can be because they can be different for different people and understanding how important that is to really understand what the values are that you're trying to identify with within um, not only a neighborhood, but a city and broader for the a country. And just to give you an example of how this is played out here and how it can impact for the world, I, I started working on a project here that was this little border, uh, border control house right on the border of Mexico, historic property owned by the government here in the US. And the, the supervisor wasn't interested in the historic components of this building and did not want to recreate them, keep them or anything. He wasn't interested in the project until we started to add this historic plaque and the restoration of this one historic plaque. That for him was so critical and he really valued that piece of, of the structure. And once we started to address the restoration of this one plaque, he got interested in the whole project. And when I met up with him at the completion of the project, he was really excited about it and was fully behind it. And I thought, now, if one, if identifying something that's of value to this one person yeah. uh, that no one else valued, no one else thought it was valuable, but if we can identify this, if this had been identified earlier, he would have been more supportive of the project. So it's really understanding that what you value or what you think is of value to other people, really having an open mind and understanding that there are many different interpretations of what that could be and hearing them and incorporating it. Uh, and that's one thing that this course for Mosul also focuses on in the second module is understanding significance and value. And um, so for me, that was, that was very beneficial and how difficult that can be for different uh, cultures who have been in constant conflict and have lost a lot of um, cultural value and things that were once of value uh, have now, people have been dispersed or to understand that um, this may be a challenging concept to understand for different people, but to hear what it is that they currently are val valuing and um, understanding and heritage in their culture. Um, Heather, you have um, a, a question in the chat. Um, that's super interesting. Uh, Emilia says, what town was it in? It was in Sassabi, uh, in Arizona, Sassabi. Tiny. I mean, it, I drove out there for the final site visit and it was just me and the border control trucks. I mean, it. <laughs> I stood out because I, I was the only one not in a government vehicle. <laughs> So, Eamon, we have um, uh, a question for you as well, for Michael. He says, I know the World Monuments Fund was funding similar work uh, to this in Iraq and also in Afghanistan. Uh, is this kind of work going on in other locations as well? By the uh, Monument Fund or the, by... Uh... Uh, well, it says Ikram. World Monuments Fund here, but I mean, uh, the ones that I know doing it are UNESCO and actually the British Museum does something similar, I think, as well. Yeah, I think there, there, there were uh, several projects, but as I know, right mm -hmm. now in, uh, in, in, in uh, Iraq specifically, I think uh, uh, just only I think uh, Ikrom is, is uh, doing yes. the capacity building. But of course, there were also uh, UNESCO uh, did the capacity building for craftspeople before, and the British Museum. Yes, I uh, I also hear about this. They did Cons conservation, didn't they? British Museum. Yeah, uh, yes, uh, yeah. But also the other other actually uh, IGOs uh, worked on uh, conservation projects, which is not capacity building, but maybe within their. Uh, capacity build uh, like conservation projects they do capacity building like actually uh, UNESCO what's uh, now they are uh, just uh, one week before uh, uh, I was uh, at w one of the sites where they are working in, in Mosul uh, conservation one of their conservation projects it's uh, at Tahira church uh, uh, they actually uh, uh, brought an Italian, I think, Italian team to uh, treat the alabaster, and uh, they also involve uh, local 
uh, Muslawis and uh, train them. Uh, I mean, uh, train, uh, train, uh, tra uh, train them by doing uh, during this. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, under this project. Yes. Um, there's also uh, a question which I guess, to a certain extent, is uh, what you're doing, um, Heather. It says, can this be a model that can be repeated elsewhere? But I think to a certain extent, that's what you're doing, isn't it? You're trying to put this online so it can be repeated we, elsewhere. We were, we ran into a few hiccups. So we're going to, we're kind of pivoting and uh, but it will be an online, um, the information will be online. It might be pr um, presented in a slightly different platform than we were originally originally going for but the information will absolutely be accessible and that that is an ongoing project absolutely and i mean if you had this set if this online course obviously you would need local tutors as well uh but if it's all set up for them it should be a lot easier to do that correct <laughs> right. yeah yeah because that's very much i know that's very much the kind of ecrom model isn't it to like train local people who then train other people. And so mm -hmm. to like um, spread spread the net as Absolutely. well. Yes, yes. Um, I'm just trying to read, we've got lots of um, questions. Uh, Michael says it may have been as long as five years ago that the World Monuments Fund did something like mm -hmm. that. Maybe, so maybe they're uh, not doing it well. Um, Andrew says, thank you to both Heather and uh, Iman, uh, for your work and commitment um, and selling the idea of uh, restoration. Um, and it, um, it's the immediate community that understands the needs and values of heritage, regardless of significance. I know, actually, Alabasta is particularly difficult to work with, isn't it? Yes. I, yes. I, I, I may have got this wrong, correct me if I did, but I seem to recall Rohit telling me once that at one point in Mosul, they were like down to the last two or three craftsmen who were capable of working alabaster. Yes, yes. This is, was actually uh, specifically track one. I mean, training a crafts uh, people was uh, more challenging actually for us because as you said, we uh, maybe some sometimes uh, just only one uh, crafts uh, pe uh, crafts person left uh, for a specific, I mean, uh, building craft. Or sometimes we had to actually brought a, a trainer from Egypt for a black uh, smithing uh, because we didn't find any uh, trainer in Iraq, for example. So it's uh, it's it's very challenging and actually sustaining uh, the traditional uh, technique and the traditional craft. It's even more uh, challenging. Yes, yes, I can imagine. Um, well, we'll have to um, draw to a close because we're running over our time. Uh, but thank you uh, very much, Iman and Heather. Um, that was really, uh, really interesting. Oh, just one last question um, to Iman. To what extent is it possible to gauge the Mosul project has contributed to the economic recovery of the city? Is it too early to say? Well, I would have thought it probably was. Is it? I mean, it takes a I, while. I, I I agree with you. I think it's uh, because actually uh, our capacity building is uh, uh, just uh, we don't offer actually uh, maybe jobs for now for the the the, the graduates for uh, I mean the participants, but actually uh, I just want to uh, highlight this, which is. Uh, uh, an interesting, uh, I would say it's uh, the most interesting outcome of our uh, project so far, which is uh, the Cycle One uh, graduate. Uh, lately, they founded uh, an NGO concerning uh, protecting cultural uh, heritage uh, in, in Iraq. And uh, they actually started now, uh, they are working on, uh, uh, I mean, working with the uh, gov government and also with the other uh, uh, parties uh, to, uh, I mean, uh, fund like do some uh, fundraising to start working on the project. So they uh, actually uh, do, do this. Uh, but uh, uh, I don't know if I have just a few time to uh, just one or two minutes to highlight this because uh, 
maybe this is not related to the question, but actually under, like the conflict, what I realized through my work in, in, uh, in, in Mosul that the conflict doesn't only affect the, the historic uh, urban fabric, but also it's uh, affected the economic fabric, the social fabric. Uh, just uh, one example of this, uh, the, the old uh, uh, gold market in, in, in Mosul, uh, after, uh, of course, it, it was in the west uh, side of Mosul, which is the old uh, side. And uh, lately it was actually reconstructed, but actually uh, the, the, I mean, the, the traders uh, the, uh, and the, the shops owners, they, they didn't come back because they already relocated to the east side of the city. Uh, and that's uh, very important that uh, to, we should uh, only, uh, we should uh, uh, understand the economic uh, sh shifts uh, or the economic uh, fabric bo uh, in post conflict as well as, uh, yeah, yeah to, to, uh, I mean, uh, uh, in order to make uh, a more uh, realistic heritage recovery for the city it's not uh, yeah. it's it's difficult uh, as as you mentioned it's uh, it's in, in Mosul actually it's a bit different because it's more complicated because more uh, ethnic religious groups were there and uh, uh, the conflict really uh, affected uh, all of this so it's a bit more complicated and definitely uh, but but actually the heritage recovery brought also uh, economic uh, opportunities uh, uh, with the with the, not only with the workers but actually more owners are now more encouraged to come back actually so the oh, come back right. to the old uh, to the old uh, city right yeah yeah I mean that's one of the things I think all places that have been through a conflict have found that I mean a lot of people obviously a lot of people were killed uh, a lot of people they fled and not all of them want to come back, you know, for some Def of them, definitely, definitely. too traumatic an experience to come back. So, you know, it's a big challenge, right? You're getting lots of compliments, uh, Iman and Heather, in the chat. Thank you. Um, thank you and congratulating you on the work you do. So it's, it's very important work and, uh, you know, it's very challenging work. I know it's very, very difficult work to do, so. So we really do have to shut down now. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for, again, the fantastic chat and all the questions. Thank you to Iman and Heather, and especially thank you to Sarah and Melissa and uh, Sama and to um, our great comms director as well, Harry, who makes all this happen. Um, he doesn't really look like a statue. That, that's, that's not a good, that's not a good photo. <laughs> Harry, he doesn't look like that at all. Uh, but okay, we'll close it. Now we will be doing another session um, in a, a little bit further down the line um, and everybody will be contacted, but you can still keep using the Facebook and the LinkedIn uh, till then. So thank you everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.